The fanged beast Goss Harag quickly became a fan favourite from the very first trailer it was revealed in. Based off the Japanese Namahage and armoured with icy blades, but still bestial and bear-like, it's the latest top predator in the guild that live in the snowy mountains. But what could be the reason for the ice swords? What's its ecology like, and why isn't this particular bear asleep in winter like the ones in our world? Let's find out. So to dive into perhaps Gosharag's most ostentatious feature, it'd be a good starting point to talk about his bizarre habit of creating ice weapons on its lower arms. The actual mechanism of the freezing probably doesn't have a real-world analogue. As a living thing, it's very hard to generate cold. And even in a world of explosion-generating dinosaurs, even the most simple ice monster is arguably harder to explain in this regard. The closest thing you could say is that Gosharag doesn't create a freezing liquid, but rather creates a fluid that has very specific molecular properties, and freezes instantly on contact with the much colder air. This isn't so far-fetched, as there's plenty of footage of people throwing hot water out and it instantly freezing in frigid conditions. But the caveat is that Gosharag is dependent on very low ambient temperatures to achieve its ice blades. In warmer conditions above freezing, it may not be able to create solid structures. Obviously, the follow-up to this is, how do Gosharag's arms manage not to freeze? The two main factors here are likely both the skin and the circulatory system. For the latter, Gosharag may use countercurrent heat exchange, which in very broad terms is warming the cooled venous blood by having the veins wrap around the artery, bringing the warmer blood to the appendage. Freezing of the tissues is prevented by a rush of blood when exposed to extreme conditions, and this fits well with the reddening of the arms when the ice blades are being used, very likely to protect the tissues from cellular death. The arms are also noticeably scaly, with thick skin and a number of plate-like growths on them. This suggests that the outermost layer of skin becomes very thick and develops into almost horn-like tissue, this would make it a very poor conductor of heat, and so little of the warmth from the inner arm would be lost through it. This could potentially be important for ice retention too. Without this almost keratinous tissue, Gosarag may lose too much heat through the arms, causing the ice to become loose or break or fall off quickly. But chiefly this layer of thick skin likely protects the arm tissues from the cold, and indeed, many arctic birds have thicker, cornified tissue on the feet for the same reason. It's also suggested it may be an adaptation on an individual level to cold environments. So whilst it may occur naturally anyway in Gosharag, skin thickness may be even greater in individuals that very regularly use the ice blades. And in turn, the follow-up to this is, why does Gosharag even need ice blades? This one is a lot harder to answer but it may be that it plays some role in predation. In its opening cutscene, it uses the ice blade to attack a pair of Anteka, as well as the hunter, but interestingly not Tetranodon in their turf war. So from this, maybe the blades are used in predation, but only on small prey. Their added reach of longer sweeps may help Gosarag unbalance small and fleet-footed animals that it may otherwise miss from ambush. It may also be of good use in fishing or catching various aquatic life, where the extended strike could allow it to hit prey unwilling to come closer to its large shadow in the water. With potentially reasonable amounts of protein stored in the river and lake beds, in the form of fish, frogs and crustaceans in torpor, it could be Gosharag can attain at least some of its nutrients from aquatic foraging, and ice blades may have something to do with this. This may also explain Tetranodon's poorly judged hostility to Gosharag. It's ruining the foraging opportunities in the area. Gosharag may in turn view Tetranodon as both potential prey and a competitor, and bears will indeed kill other carnivores if they can, and rarely eat them afterwards too. Tetranodon's mass saves it from this fate at least some of the time. From this interaction, it also seems that it's not likely that the ice blades are used for large prey, or in combat with other large monsters. It's telling that the blades aren't used in this turf war, and this is actually a moment of reasonable restraint on Capcom's behalf. Against a large, solid-bodied target, the ice would likely snap off the arm or shatter entirely, and be quite useless as a weapon. 
A few blows into the ground when Gosharag fights the hunter are enough to break them as is. It may also be possible, and perhaps even likely, that hunting is mainly a secondary use for the Ice Blades, and they may function as tools over weapons. Bears are no strangers to tool use, and are incredibly intelligent animals with both captive and wild animals being recorded to use external objects. So it seems likely Gosarag is a very intelligent animal, although it's not certain if he's smarter than the average bear. Long story short, tool use is a complex behaviour that forces you to relearn the parameters of your own body, to incorporate something else as a usable object. For a deeper dive into why tool use is a good indicator of intelligence, go watch Kula's chapter of the Birdwiven video. One use seen in a wild bear was grooming, with a bear using a rough rock to rub itself with. Why exactly its claws couldn't do this job is unknown. But the greater reach of Gosharag's ice blades, as well as the ability to make them into reasonably sharp edges, would make them a useful tool to dislodge dirt, parasites, or other such filth. Another example of tool use in bears is to overcome obstacles a bear's large size wouldn't allow it to. Brown bears in captivity learn to stack items to reach a food reward, and a polar bear used a tool to dislodge food it couldn't otherwise reach as well. These pictures come from a paper discussing the potential of polar bears using tools to kill walruses in the right circumstances, pushing boulders or ice blocks off cliffs to fatally strike them. Polar bears will also use tools to make toys, and spring traps that they have experience with, so there's a lot of ways smaller bears at least can use tools. But trying to come up with non-combat uses for Gosarag's ice blades is difficult, as Gosarag is such a powerful yet dexterous animal, it's hard to think of a scenario where it can't just brute force its way to the solution. Even foraging for protein like shellfish, or digging out small animals, Gosarag's relatively mobile forepaws and sharp claws would still likely be a more precise solution than the ice blades. And as we'll discuss, Gosarag's carnivory means that it's unlikely to be foraging for anything other than animal protein. The main or original use of Gosarag's ice blades seems uncertain for now at least, and speculation is always welcome. No matter how Gosarag gets its daily bread, it's described as a carnivore. Whilst a lot view bears as mainly subsisting on honey and stolen sandwiches, outside of even the seal-eating polar bear, other species are surprisingly predatory as well. Brown bears in some areas get much of their nutrients from ungulates. They're regular and successful killers, with some records showing them capable of killing several musk oxen in a single sitting when circumstances are good, as well as killing prey like large adult moose incredibly swiftly. But the key point to consider is, what are the factors driving some brown bears to be more predatory than others, and how does this apply to Goss Harag? This mainly seems to be the abundance of other and easier food in the region, and it's likely the individual bears too. In the barren ground grizzlies, they regularly eat caribou as there's essentially very little else to eat for a large portion of the year. In Yellowstone National Park, declines in cutthroat trout led to brown bears becoming more predatory, and taking more elk calves to pick up the dietary slack. Larger bears also need more nutritious, energy-dense food, ideally meat, and so there's a very noticeable bias in some studies of male bears having more meat-dense diets than females, as well as their greater mass also making them more effective killers. So when we apply all of this to Gosarag, it becomes clear why it's made that dietary shift to carnivory. It dwarfs the other ursid-like species in Monster Hunter, and will have far greater nutritional requirements. The honey Azuros is so fond of is more energy-dense than animal protein, but there's also far less of it. Similarly, the energetic cost of catching fish is much steeper for the larger Gosarag for the reward of eating it. As said earlier, meat is likely the only thing that can satisfy a bear that big, and it's worth noting too the largest bear ever, Arctodus, showed numerous adaptations for pursuit predation. On top of this, Gosarag lives in the frigid frost isles. Here, rich plant matter like nuts and berries and other food like honey are also likely in very short supply. The habitat it's adapted to live in has only further pushed it to carnivory. 
Much as the polar bear is the most carnivorous bear of all, living in the Arctic with nothing to eat but fish, seals, and cetaceans. A look inside Gosarag's mouth also seems to support this. From what we can see, it has very reduced molars, showcased by this excellent skull drawn by I am the Caillou King. This fits with skull morphology in more carnivorous bears in our own world, which show reduced molars due to a less tough, fibrous diet of plant matter compared to other bears. Modern polar bears only actually diverged from brown bears in the Pleistocene, and these two species still have some adaptations for more omnivorous diets even when they live a more carnivorous lifestyle. The reduction in cheek teeth in Gosarag, though, is far more extensive, and as we established, it's a purely predatory animal. So in comparative terms, it's likely an older, more specialised and far more divergent species than the polar bear too. Regarding its skull, a key feature of Gosarag is the scaly sheath of tissue over the face, that it can flush with blood in the right circumstances. Whilst the tissue is still vascularised, it's also immobile and prevents much in the way of facial expressions compared to the muscular lips of other mammals. And this is an interesting touch. Bears in the right circumstances can be much more social than first thought, or at least have occasional social gatherings when resources in the area undergo significant spikes. In intraspecific interactions between the species, their muscular mammalian faces are important for producing expressions that telegraph intentions and emotions as they're felt. And Gosarag can't do this. Whilst it can flush red to presumably show aggression or hostility, and has a range of vocal expressions to further express itself, the complete inability to make facial expressions may well show a significant change from other bears. Bear intraspecific fighting can often target the face, and Gosarag may have some of the fiercest intraspecific competition among bears due to an all-meat diet, and living in a hostile and relatively resource-poor environment it may have made the partial trade-off of sociality and expression for facial protection, with tough, stiff facial tissue protecting the face during bouts of aggression. Gosarag, in turn, may be more solitary than other bears due to limited resources, lessening the need for being able to communicate with its own kind. With Gosarag, it's hard to imagine any amicable gatherings at whale carcasses or salmon runs. Instead, it's just the biggest male dominating the food supply, only allowing in viable females assuming they're in season, and eating until he's satiated and leaves or the resource is completely consumed. Other Gosarag can only approach at their peril. Something that stands out too is that Gosarag doesn't hibernate or seem to undergo any period of torpor like other bears. If it being active in the frost islands when there's heavy snowfall is anything to go by, Whilst there are some bear species that don't hibernate due to living in tropical or subtropical regions, some individuals of hibernating bears don't always bed down for the winter. These become known as shaitan bears, and they occur in individuals that didn't get enough food to last them through a full hibernation period. They will readily eat anything they come across, and will dig out and cannibalize other bears from their winter dens. This is occasionally reported in both American and Eurasian brown bears, but this particular study was done in an area where bears are primarily herbivorous. Nutritious plant life can be hard to come by in a boreal winter, unless you have a lot of adaptations for it, and it may be possible that in its evolutionary history, the ancestor of Gosarag was once a more generalist animal that had a more typical bear-like ecology and as they became more predatory, hibernation became less important for them as they could continually hunt throughout the winter, predating hardy boreal herbivores and scavenging winter-killed animals. What began as Shaitan Gosarag ancestors actually surviving winters due to having a diet of more meat, eventually wound up into them speciating into the fanged beast we know today. There may be some parallels with bear evolution in our own world too, in the Pleistocene, brown bears and cave bears lived in similar areas, with the brown bears being more carnivorous and cave bears being primarily herbivorous. The two exhibited fairly strong niche partitioning, and also shared a common ancestor. Due to a myriad of factors, possibly including their herbivorous diet, cave bears went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene, whereas brown bears persevered. 
Maybe this is something similar to Gosarag's history. Having a more generalist common ancestor that diverged into both a more herbivorous and a more carnivorous form, with their latter surviving. Gosarag is described in the Rise art book as not having a set territory, instead just roaming over large areas in search of prey. Traversing over huge areas isn't unusual for bears, and is most prevalent in polar bears. Surprisingly, females at least do show home ranges, albeit enormous ones, that fit with the harshness of the landscape they live in. Their territories also fluctuate with the seasons and with prey availability, so something similar may occur for Gosarag, rather than it having no territory at all. They may just range over such enormous areas that it's hard to call it much of a real territory. Interestingly, they also still scent mark despite this. In this case, rather than to denote ownership over an area, it's likely to signal other Gosarag. Bears still do much of their communicating via scent marks, and it's also the chief way females signal that they're in heat, so these markings likely serve as message boards rather than border markers, telling other individuals of the species about who has just been here. For males, this serves as either a warning or a challenge, and likely for females too, unless they're in heat. So to give my thoughts on Goss, I'd definitely say I'm in the minority where I'm pretty nonplussed with it really. Definitely not in my top 10 or 20 on first sight like the rest of the fandom it seems. And truth be told on seeing him, my first reaction was more worry than anything else until gameplay showed him moving more as a quadruped, and much more animalistic than the first glimpses suggested. In terms of his fight, he's just sort of like the other Rise originals, in that more than anything else I wish the game was harder so he could feel like more of a challenge. Goss especially is almost like a Spinus, in that his normal state is incredibly slow, and with attack wind up so long, you can probably complete another quest in them, but then becoming much more swift and aggressive on enraging, which is a shame as you can still just slice through him angry or not. With his very anime fight and the love of the fandom, Goss is also a strong contender for Rajangification. I can definitely see him being bumped to a sub-elder tier for no good reason in the future, and I'll admit I'm a little cautious to see what subspecies he gets in Sunbreak. I don't think Goss really needs one, and if it did get an alteration, I think a variant or deviant would really be best. Like the behaviour of Shaitan Bears, I think a Goss forced to behave in a different way would be a lot more interesting, and make a lot more sense than just an elemental swap. One with a damaged ice organ or something that was forced to become much more hands-on and primal I think would be pretty cool. If water combat ever comes back, and I hope it will if refined, a polar bear themed fanged beast that can swim and has some submerged attacks would also be really cool. Thanks for watching. And thanks to I Am The Caillou King for their excellent Gosharag Skull too. Zal has also done a reaction video to my Devil Joe video, so you can check that out. If nothing else, I've finally made it to the big leagues with people reacting to my content. Who knows what's next? A quick point on the last video, as a few of you asked what I thought Cephadrome's paralytic fins were for, and in this case I really think it's as basic as an anti-predator mechanism, like those of a lionfish or something similar. Big as Cephadrome is, it's still a potential target for some other carnivores. As we approach February, we also come close to the one year anniversary of the Unnatural History Channel. Who knows, maybe we should do something... Fun. Mmm. Well, at least fun by my normal standards. I know, I'm debasing myself. Anyway. I don't know what everyone's thoughts on this are, if they'd rather me push on with the normal content, or have something more relaxed, like a Q&A, or the other fun things YouTubers do. But at any rate, I've put a poll in the community section that I finally used for the first time, so you can make some suggestions. And here's the teaser for the next episode, a surprisingly often requested one that was quite hard to actually find a noise for. See if you can guess it.